All right. Good afternoon, everyone, as we see people trickling in. Thank you so much for joining our Michi and Walter Weglin Endowed Social Justice Series. Um, it is such an honor and a privilege for me to direct the Weglin Endowment. Uh, and work with some incredible colleagues. And today we um, have the honor of having one of our very own, Dr. Jose um, Aguilar Hernandez, who have been able to coordinate this wonderful session dealing with the topic that is so relevant today. And he is gonna go into that. But before that, I just wanted to share a little bit about Michi and Walter Wuglin Endowment. Um, by first, I'm, I'm horrible at this and I'm trying to get better is providing a land acknowledgement to where we sit. I know that we come from multiple spaces and places around the nation and possibly the world. And so for, for Cal Poly Pomona, we sit on the land of the Tongva people. And I am currently actually in Hawaii. And so I'm on the land of the native Hawaiians. If you can't on your chat, please just put down where you're from. So that way we can get a sense of you know, the space that we're um, honoring um, and acknowledging the place that we come from, the indigenous group, uh, we're lit state, uh, living and working and residing in the space of indigenous communities. So if you don't mind doing that, that would be wonderful. Um, so a little bit about Michi and Walter Weglin. Uh, they were friends of Cal Poly and our former president, Bob and Agnes Suzuki, and they gifted our campus with this wonderful endowment where they hoped and put upon us to continue the work of social justice. Michi wrote a book called The Years, A Year of Infamy, talking about the internment. And we did this back in February during the redress um, period and uh, the redress anniversary, uh, where uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt signed an executive order interning people of Japanese descent, um, where People of Japanese descent were put into concentration camps and sent abroad to Japan and Latin America and around the world. Michi and Walter's relationship stem from Walter being a survivor of the Holocaust and Michi a survivor of the internment. And together they really wanted to create a space and place on our campus where we can unpack and dialogue about issues facing marginalized communities. I think for them, anti-racist work, social justice work, and inclusivity of all groups, including LGBT, disabled communities, and other marginalized communities were all integrated, that we are not separate, but equal, that we are some of whole, we are all part together. And so with that, I know that they would be so thrilled to have this session today, especially with what we have been witnessing in the media recently with the rise of anti-Asian hate, and the incident that happened in Atlanta, killing eight people, six of whom were of Asian descent. And I think the, uh, the talk today and the panel today about microaggression and racism is something that I'm hoping that we can all take away and really think about how do we impact our communities? How do we impact our own work? How do we take this knowledge that our experts are sharing with us today to really do what we need to, to create a mo more just society, not just for a few, but for all of us. So with that, I want to introduce my awesome colleague, Dr. Jose Aguilar Hernandez, who also serves on the Wegland Endowed Advisory Committee, who has been a champion for our students and scholarship that engages our community. And he will be doing the introduction for this session today. With that, Dr. Aguilar Hernandez. Thank you so much to uh, Dr. Mary Danico for uh, jumping on board to support this program for today. Um, I'd like to just say a few things before I introduce our speakers today. Uh, first and foremost, um, this event is titled Racial Microaggressions, Using Critical Race Theory to Respond to Everyday Racism. And as a lot of you um, might already know on the flyer um, that was sent out by the Weglin. Um, it, this conversation is based on this um, amazing book that just came out not too long ago um, that um, uh, I think really captures um, today's conversation 
and, and is really one of the most kind of up-to-date conversations around racial microaggressions, not just in terms of like, what are they, but also what do we do about them? And how can we uh, engage in uh, practices that challenge uh, microaggressions and that really um, push against the impacts of race and racism? Um, for those of us in education, we're interested in this conversation in our schools. But um, I think this conversation extends to many other places, including um, nonprofit sectors, um, the private, private industries, um, our own homes, our own communities, the media, film, uh, children's books. There's so many places where um, racial microaggressions appear. And um, it's such an important conversation that we'll have today, considering um, the atrocities and the um, impact of how um, anti-Asian racism is on the increase, um, you know, not just you know, locally, but across the nation. And also to think about how anti-Asian racism is a manifestation of white supremacy and how that system of white supremacy impacts and informs anti-Blackness, anti-Mexican, anti-Latinx, um, anti-Indigenous community, I mean, uh, Muslim communities, um, this is something that is linked. Um, and uh, if there's uh, something that I'm really excited about is, is when I read this book, is seeing the ways in which um, Solorzano and Perez Uber, um, and also the artwork on the cover by Dr. Garcia, who we'll hear from today, really captures the, the multiple communities that are impacted by white supremacy um, throughout time and in history. Um, I'll, I'll share that this event, um, we're, we're really lucky. Um, uh, we also have the co-sponsorship of the Cesar E. Chavez Center for Higher Education at Cal Poly Pomona. So a special shout out to Wendy Cordova for um, your leadership and ensuring that this event um, you know, took place. And I also want to acknowledge that this talk is happening during my class. Um, so when I landed at Cal Poly Pomona, I landed at an interesting time. We were still in the quarter system we were getting ready to transition to the semester system. And um, in my department, they asked the question of, does anyone want to write a new course? And I was like, we don't have a course yet in education, specifically um, in the Department of Ethnic and Women's Studies. And I was um, happy enough to, to, to propose it and the department agreed and it went all the way up. And I want to say this is maybe the third time that I'm teaching this course um, at Cal Poly Pomona. And um, this course is really a response to the students who have been asking, how do we talk about social justice work in schools? Um, I'm in the College of Education and Integrative Studies. I'm an associate professor. And I often think about how so many of our students um, are gonna go into early childhood, are gonna go into teacher, um, you know, whether it be K through 12, or a lot of them go into student affairs or higher education the nonprofit sector, social work. And um, this course is always changing based on the feedback that my students give me at the end of the year. Last year, at the kind of dawn of the Black Lives Matter movement going global at the start of the pandemic, I asked my students last year, what does next year's class have to include? And their response is racial microaggressions and we need to talk about anti-Blackness more directly. So this is a response to my students from last year and very timely, this book came out um, after that. And it, and it really speaks to what on the, and this is what I love a lot about the folks on today's panel is that um, uh, scholars who are scholar activists or people who are researchers, but are interested in creating change, they have their ear um, uh, to the ground. And what I mean by that is that we are called to listen to what our communities are asking for. That's what makes our scholarship activist is when we are creating change through the work that we're doing, not just publishing articles or books to collect dust, but publishing articles and books to um, unsettle that dust, especially the dust of white supremacy, which is pretty much uh, prevalent in not only the libraries of our institutions, but in administrative offices and faculty offices, classrooms and beyond. So this is really um, a response to that. And I want to acknowledge um, my 29 students that are taking the course this semester that are online and um, I'm seeing you all log on and uh, a very, very special welcome 
to uh, over 100 guests. Thank you for being here. And I, as I was looking from all over the US, but we also have some folks joining from abroad. Thank you for being part of this conversation. And one of the reasons why I think that this um, uh, conversation and this webinar has attracted uh, so much interest, um, not only locally, but across the US and um, nationally, Part of it is that this book was, was published and we, we want more conversations on this book and we get to hear from the authors and the artists of the cover themselves in this webinar. But I think it's also because of the rich trajectory of um, these scholar activists um, in the work that they've been doing for many, many years. So um, the way that today will take place after um, my brief remarks is that we will hand it over to Dr. Daniel Solorzano and Dr. Lindsay perez Huber, who will be talking about the book in terms of the content and some of the major things that they covered throughout the book. Um, after that, we will be having Dr. Luis Garcia, who will be talking to us about the artwork on the cover of the book um, and uh, contextualizing it within the process with uh, Dr. Solorzano and Dr. Perez Uber, but also in terms of him as an educator and, and his story is incredibly important and his activism has been really important. So I'll begin by introducing um, the two co-authors of the book, Racial Microaggressions. I'll start with um, Lindsay Perez Uber, who is an associate professor in the Social and Cultural Analysis of Education master's program in the College of Education at our sister campus at California State University, Long Beach. Uh, Dr. Perez's Uber, uh, research agenda uses interdisciplinary perspectives to analyze racial inequities in education, the structural causes of those inequities, and how they mediate educational trajectories and outcomes for students of color. In addition, she examines how those students challenge and resist the oppression they encounter within and outside of education. And her research specializations include race, immigration, and higher education, racial microaggressions, and critical race gendered methodologies and epistemologies. And on a personal note, uh, Dr. Peter Suber uh, was one of the advanced students in the doctoral program um, at UCLA in the social sciences and comparative education program where we met. Um, and it was always great to learn from uh, her research and uh, the research that she did along with her colleagues. There's so many that I could think of right now that were part of that community. Um, and uh, second, um, Dr. Dr. Daniel G. Solorzano, who a lot of us that um, have been mentored and advised by him, um, de cariño, out of love, we, we always call him Danny, and that's because he, he, he loves us that way. Uh, Danny is a professor of uh, social science and comparative education um, and Chicana Chicano and Central American Studies at UCLA. He is also the director of the Center for Critical Race Studies in Education at UCLA. In 2020, Solorzano was elected uh, to the National Academy of Education, which is a very, very um, important uh, step in uh, Danny's career. Um, his teaching and research interests include critical race theory in education, racial microaggressions, racial, racial microaffirmations, and critical race spatial analysis. Uh, Dr. Solorzano has authored more than 100 research articles, book chapters, and books on issues related to educational access and equity for underrepresented student populations and communities in the United States. And a few words just on a personal level. Um, Danny's incredibly humble um, and he doesn't always like when we you know, do this, which would, what I'm about to do. And those of you that have been his student know this and look, he's already kind of turning in his seat, <laughs> but um, we love Danny. And we love Danny because uh, for a number of reasons and I'll, I'll, I'll share two right now. The first one is, um, he's considered one of the, the, the original scholars that um, brought critical race theory and education to education. And he did it well. And he did it in a way that disrupted um, the silence around race and racism in educational research, um, along with so many other scholars that also brought that work over to the field of education. And I say he did it well because he learned from one of the scholars um, that is considered the founders of critical race theory, which is Derek Bell. And um, he, he didn't just read Derek Bell's work, like he, he reached out in, in, in those days by e emailing uh, Derek Bell and, and asking questions about critical race theory and education and really developing uh, what he brought and established in, uh, in the field of education. So we have a lot to owe, we owe him a lot in education because of what he brought over. 
And on a, and on a, on a more personal level, and I know that all of your advisees and all the people that have worked with you that are logged on right now can share this. Um, Professor Solarsano is, is an advocate and um, someone who um, steps up up and, and speaks uh, on behalf of the needs of the students that he works with. Uh, so many of us um, joined the professoriate thanks to his mentorship and his support. And I really think of the importance of that uh, role that he's taken on as an example of scholar activism and as a response to white supremacy and a response to the ways in which institutions um, keep us out or lock us out. Um, so really want to thank you for the love and mentorship and I think the, the fact that this book was written with one of your advisees um, is, is a perfect example of, of who you are as, as an advisor. So um, Cal Poly Pomona is my home, my academic home. And for me, it's, it's great to welcome you both. Um, and I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Jose. Thank you very much for that introduction. And thank you, Mary and Daniela also uh, for supporting us here uh, <clears throat> as we move forward. Um, I'm going to, what, what's going to happen is that the order of, of this presentation is going to be that Lindsay and I are going to talk about the book. And then after, after that, uh, uh, Luis is going to talk about the cover. But in some ways, the cover actually uh, sets up the book. But I, we'll get this right, Luis. But because uh, but, I, I, I really, uh, when we've done this before, having this conversation about the uh, about the cover is it just it's just a nice catalyst into the in, into the book itself, um, but we're going to go for, first if you don't mind, um, and I'm going to share my screen. And as we do this, I want to um, also uh, share with you all um, that uh, this is going to be a conversation, and th that's how we work. That's how uh, I've worked with Lindsay, with, with Jose, with other other of my doctoral former doctoral students how me and Luis and and um, and uh, Lindsay worked on this cover that you see here um, and um, I, I I just wanted to let you know that this is a conversation we're going to have we're going to be having and it's going to be it, it, it's, it's really our reflections on how we came to do this book okay and so um, the book is basically, it, it's titled Racial Microaggressions Using Critical Race Theory to Respond to Everyday Racism. It has about six or seven chapters in the book. The first one is on origin stories. The second chapter is on our conceptual work on coming to critical race theory. The third chapter is on the types, the context, effects and responses to racial microaggressions. Uh, the, the fourth chapter deals with questions around macro versus micro in terms of uh, racial microaggressions. And then finally, we talk about internalized racism in chapter five, um, racial microaffirmations in chapter six. And in the final chapter, we talk about promising areas and disruptions that we think um, the field should be moving towards. We hope we'll be moving towards. And um, probably many people on this call are, are moving in, in, in that direction uh, as well. And so this first chapter, we, we talk about our origin stories, really how we came to study racial microaggressions. And, and I'll begin by telling my story, and then we'll talk, uh, then Lindsay will share her story. But actually, my story begins, um, it, it actually begins with, uh, with my own sort of training. I, I, as, a, as an undergraduate student at Loyola University uh, in, between 68 and 72, uh, I, I went through many different majors. I, I started off as a business major. Uh, I, was, I was a business major for two years. Um, uh, and then I moved on to um, sociology, film, uh, ended up with sort of this dual sort of major of sociology and, and, and Mexican, at, at the time it was called Mexican American studies. This was really pivotal in my own development as, as a scholar. Um, I, I went on to teach, I was a high school teacher in the LA County Juvenile uh, Hall or Juvenile Facility. Uh, I was a social studies teacher. And it's in that space that I, that I was introduced to Pablo Pérez. And he and his work has been really instrumental in my work and my teaching uh, uh, for the last uh, 50, 60 years. So here's my story about how I came to do racial microaggressions. <clears throat> in 1993, actually, um, I was in the law library looking up, as Pepe mentioned, I was trying to understand what critical race theory in the law was. What were they doing? Um, and how can we apply what they were doing to the field of education? or to, to the field of sociology. But specifically, I was in the education department at the time. I was at UCLA. 
I'd only been there three years. That's my first, my, 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 my third year when I initially started looking at this area called critical race theory and the law. And I came across this article in the Yale Law Journal. It was called Law is Microaggression by Peggy Davis. She wrote this in 1989. So she wrote it about three years prior to, four years prior to the, the, when, when I was sitting in the law library when I found this. But this is the first time that I had seen the word microaggression. This is the first time. This is the, and I was fascinated by this, this idea that I had never heard of. And so as I was reading the article, I came across footnote number five, and she introduced me to Chester Pierce. And it's Chester Pierce, who is the founder, who is the, whose work is seminal in, in the development of everyday racism in the form of racial microaggressions. And so I just want to recognize Chet's work and his work continues to impact me. Um, Chet, Chet Pierce uh, was, he's now passed on, was a professor of education uh, and a professor of medicine at Harvard University in the School of Medicine and the School of Education, Graduate School of Education. But his work has been really just in, instrumental in, 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 and it continues to be. I mean, I, I think some of you probably have the same experience. I keep rereading Chet's work and I keep learning new things. And I started reading him, um, you know, 28 years ago. But uh, he's still mentoring me. He's still engaging with me. Uh, every time I pick up an article or reread an article or find something else about his life history. Uh, but I want to recognize Chet's work. Um, but if, if you ask me today, what article would you start with? What would you start with, Danny, if you wanted to look at racial microaggressions and you wanted to understand where Chet Pierce was coming from? I would say, pick up this chapter in Fred Barber's The Black 70s. Um, and it, it's a chapter called Offensive Mechanisms. And it's in this chapter where he introduces us to the concept of microaggressions. But he does this in a way that's just amazing the storytelling that takes place in this chapter. Um, but this is the chapter where I would start. Uh, I wouldn't end there. I would continue to read some of his other work. He has at least 13 other pieces of scholarship on racial microaggressions that he, that he published between 1969 and about 2004, I believe, was the last time he published a piece on racial microaggressions. So again, my story begins with Chet. And so I'm gonna turn this one now over to, to Lindsay. Thanks, Danny. And thank you everyone who has invited us here, Dr. Avila Hernandez and the team at the Wegman Center. Um, I'm so happy to be here to be talking about this book with, uh, with Danny and with Luis. Um, I, I guess I'll start with, with my story, um, which is very much a part of, of Danny's story if you read the beginning of this book on our origin stories. Um, similar to Danny, I, I think the, the way that I um, kind of came to wanting to understand race and racism and education was my undergraduate experience. I went to UC Irvine and I was a part of, at the time they had just developed the, the um, it was called Chicano Latino Studies major at UCI. And so uh, I was um, majoring in political science at the time and um, finding the ethnic studies classes and feeling engaged and connected and learning about my community was just something that really, I think, changed my trajectory. I, I was actually thinking of going to, to law school to become an attorney, so I was majoring in political science for that reason. And when I began to take these courses, um, it was just kind of this, this light bulb, right? That this, this light that goes off inside of you when you realize this is actually what you wanna do. This is what you're interested in. Um, and, and so I, um, I graduated and I knew I wanted to do something around race, racism, and education. I came to, at the time, there were very few programs where you could look at these issues in the field of ed. And one of the few programs was at UCLA in the Social Science and Comparative Education program where, where I both students, um, graduate students, and I, I was just uh, so happy to me. Um, I, I would echo. And, and so when I came into, um, I started as a master's uh, student in, in the program, um, Danny and Walter Allen were doing some really important work on the Gruder case, which is uh, a affirmative action case in Michigan. And they were actually doing some of the, the first empirical work in education. Danny, Danny did a, a piece in 1998 that was kind of the first empirical piece in, in the field of education on racial microaggressions. 
but they were also doing this really important work um, gaining support for um, for affirmative action right and using using race or being able to use race in decision making for admissions in, in Michigan and so they were uh, collecting data at the time and so I was taking I think I was taking a class with Danny and I was taking a class with Dr. Walter Allen, and they were talking to us about this work that they were doing, this research on racial microaggressions. And I thought, it, I remember thinking it was just so fascinating. So the first paper I wrote, one of the first paper, my first semesters as a grad student was on racial microaggression. I was just learning, reading about their work. Um, can you hear me? Okay, I'm gonna, hold on one second. Okay, can you can you hear me now? That's better. Okay, <laughs> thank you. I wasn't reading. Um, I'm sorry, and I wasn't reading the chat. Um, so I'm not sure how much you. <laughs> but I was I was working with Danny um, on uh, it, well, actually learning about racial microaggressions. Uh, and from from there, um, a paper on racial microaggressions. Um, reading Danny and Walter Allen's work and other folks who were doing this work at the time, Grace Carroll um, and some other scholars that, that were doing racial microaggressions. Um, and, and 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 another important piece for me was working at the UCLA Chicano Studies Research Center. So I started working there as a student. Um, on a, a, a work study loan, right? And I just kind of walked in and asked if there was anything I could do. And um, it just so happened that the research center was um, trying to start a, a project on examining uh, the Latino educational pipeline. And so I started working um, in at the center, um, developing a conference and also a report on kind of the critical transitions in the pipeline. Um, and so, so it was it was that experience um, that uh, and also kind of a, a, an important historical piece that was happening at the time was um, demonstrations and and resistance to a bill called HR 4437 in 2006, which is which was a um, an anti immigrant bill um, further criminalized undocumented communities. Uh, and wanting to look at this intersection of racism and uh, nativism that was happening, uh, at, uh, an anti-Latino uh, anti form of racism and, and naming that. And so I worked with Danny and, and other colleagues at, in actually peers in my program um, on this concept of racist nativism. And so my, my early, early work on microaggressions was actually looking at racist nativist microaggressions. So how do undocumented communities experience uh, racism, that, that intersection of racism and nativism through a critical race theory lens. Um, and I, I think we'll talk a little bit later about kind of thinking about how we bridge um, racial microaggressions and also Chicana feminisms, which Chicana feminism in, in this book. Um, but I, I think, you know, where Danny and I um, kind of came together in this chapter. So Danny tells his origin story, I tell my origin story. Um, and then we talk about kind of how we came together to work on, on the microaggressions work. And that was through um, doing some trainings for the University of California Office of the President. Um, and uh, the 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 chairs and deans on racial microaggressions and how to disrupt racial microaggressions on um, you know at, at their institutions, and so I think the early early workings of this book um, kind of began with that project. If if you if, I think Danny, that's that's kind of how I I imagine um, uh, I remember that it happened, uh, and and so we'll talk a little bit later about some of the 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 critiques that we address from that work that came up. Um, from from working on those trainings, um, but again, I, I I do this work really because of um, you know the the training that I got as a student at UCLA and and working with Danny, who has been uh, a huge part of this work. So that's that's uh, my origin you, story. I'm going to go back to the screen again, and 
And so th th this is our first chapter. We just, um, we, we, here we sort of lay out the, the conceptual groundwork um, for, the, for the, our understanding of racial microaggressions. Here we talk about counter storytelling uh, of everyday racism. We talk about majoritarian stories of everyday racism. And here's where we address some of the critics of uh, racial microaggressions that have been out there and continue to be out there. Uh, that, that some of you probably have read. And we've had to, to deal with in various ways. Uh, we also talk about recognizing the history to name everyday racism, which we'll talk about in a second. We talk in this chapter about Chester Pierce a little more deeply about how he influenced our work and continues to influence our work. We define our concepts of these two major concepts in the work, and that's race and racism. And then we, we talk about how we use CRT. And that's a unique part of this book is that we really, there's been other books on, on racial microaggressions. Our, our colleague at Columbia University, Daryl Sue, does some really good work on, 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 on racial microaggressions. Um, uh, although he calls them microaggressions because he looks at various forms of microaggressions, not just racial, but gender, um, disability, and other, uh, other, other uh, identities, marginalized identities. Um, but he doesn't use a critical race framework. And I think our work specifically uses a critical race framework. And that's what we'll be talking about. Lindsay now, because there's a there's a there's a couple of uh, quotes in the beginning that she wants to share as as we, we start this chapter. We talk about some of the about some of the counter stories. So Lindsay. Thanks, Danny. Yeah, so um I, I think one thing that we wanted to do in this chapter was um begin with the voices of people of color experiencing racial microaggressions. And so at the beginning, um we'll share one example here, but we were also um, very intentional and having um, um, a voice from um, all ra major racial ethnic groups in, um, in, in the US. And so this begins with um, Esmeralda Bermudez, who's actually an LA, LA Times journalist. Uh, and, and I read this, I think it was a Saturday, a Saturday morning paper um, where uh, she wrote about this experience. She said, I felt her staring at me on the playground as I called out to my daughter. She must be someone's grandmother, I, I thought. She must be curious as people often are. Speak English, she commanded. You're confusing the poor girl. My stomach dropped. I rose from the grass and braced myself to respond. And I did, but not before an old familiar feeling washed over me, a mix of fear and shame I used to carry like a knapsack in grade school. I was seven years old, just two years older than my daughter is now. You wet back, dirty beaner, go back to Tijuana. You sound like Ricky Ricardo. So many days at Lake Marie Elementary School ended the same way for me, angry and broken, waiting by the rose, rose bushes for my mom's beat up blue Datsun, wearing my knockoff sneakers and cheap ruffled dresses from a swap meet. I thought I would never catch up. And so this is just kind of one of the quotes that we give at the beginning of this chapter. Um, again, really wanting to begin laying the groundwork for what racial microaggressions are with the experiences of people of color, which of course is um, central to using a critical race theory perspective um, in racial microaggressions research. And so we, we also in this chapter talk about, we place our, 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 our stories about racial microaggressions within a history, a short history of, of, of racism and anti-blackness. Uh, within the United States, and so we, we argue that that in this in this early part of of, 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 the, of the history of, of this part of the world, um, there are centuries of indigenous genocide in the Americas, and, and we we use a 1619 date because you'll see for reason why in a second, but we we know that this history goes back even further, um, and, and it, it's all, it's often focused specifically on 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 the genocide of indigenous folks in in, in, in the Americas. Um, but we started in 1619 because of Jamestown, because at that point, this is when the first enslaved Africans arrived in North America. Um, and the, the, I mean, enslaved Africans, um, people, black people were enslaved from 1619 to 1865, formally or legally enslaved. So that's about 62% of US history is the history of enslavement of black people. Um, and it, it's, it's, it's actually 246 years of legal enslavement. In this period of between 1865 and, 19, and 1965, this 100 year period, which makes up about 25% of our history, it's about 100 years of Jim Crow or legalized segregation, legalized uh, separation, uh, whether it's in schools, in housing, at the workplace, in politics, 
even though we're seeing some of that even to this day, some of it, it's called the new Jim Crow, as you'll see in a second. But this 100 year period, uh, you know, post uh, legal enslavement was what we call the Jim Crow era. And this was post enslavement. And then from 1865 to, to, to the present 2021, this represents only about 13% of, 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 of history, of this history. Uh, from 1619 on. And this is 50, 56 years of what uh, Michelle Alexander calls the new Jim Crow, right? And you're seeing some of that right now in some of the, uh, the, the bills that are being passed in state legislatures around the country uh, to, to uh, disenfranchise what's going to be mostly folks of color and poor folks uh, from voting in the polls. And so we, we lay this out, this sort of history, because I, we think that everyday racism takes place within this context of, of, of history, a, a context, an ideology or structures of white supremacy are throughout this history that we try to, to highlight uh, in, in, in this visual in, in, as we lay out the foundations for our work. And so chapter two, um, understanding the types, context effects and responses to racial microaggressions using race, critical race hypos. Um, we, we start with this model, and this model sort of has guided us for most of our work, it's guided me for most of the work, where we talk about the types of racial microaggressions, the context in which they occur, the effects of racial microaggressions on people on the receiving end, and then how people of color respond to racial microaggressions. So this, this framework or this model has been sort of foundational to the work now for, for, for at least a couple of decades with some modifications. And so, um, you know, we, we actually have a hypothetical in that in that chapter. But as Pepe was saying earlier, I mean, that hypothetical really comes from Derek Bell. And it comes from this book. Um, this is, I think, the last version, this is the sixth edition of uh, his, uh, his, his constitutional law book on race, racism, and American law. This is foundational for those, of, those who study race in law, Derek Bell's uh, his, uh, case book. Um, this was the last one was 2006, but here's an example of what, if you, if you get a chance to look at this, and for some reason it's not moving forward, um, you see um, at the end of each chapter, there's something he calls a racism hypothetical or racism hypo. Um, I would recommend that you take a look at these. These are amazing teaching and pedagogical exercises that you can use and or adapt in your particular context. So this one happens to be in education. And the title of this hypothetical is called Excluded White Applicants versus Howard University De School of Dentistry. It's a powerful sort of, uh, of uh, hypothetical you know, that engages in conversations around race, um, whiteness, uh, whiteness as property, and all these different uh, really important critical race tools. Uh, but he, he engages in, in, in a really powerful sort of example of this. Uh, with this hypothetical. And we try to honor him by, by creating a hypothetical in, in, in this chapter of the book. Um, the third chapter deals, Lindsay, was there anything there that you need to, that you were gonna chime in on? Or you're coming up, you're coming up, I see. Yeah. I'm looking at my notes here. Um, this chapter deals with micro versus macro in researching racial microaggressions. And so, the micro, the macroaggression, and we use this idea of a tree metaphor that Lindsay will go over in a second. Uh, we talk about the macroaggression as the roots of racism. Uh, we talk about institutional racism as the trunk and the branches, racial microaggressions as the leaves, and we apply the framework. So Lindsay, I'm gonna let you take over from here. Thanks, Danny. Um, so I think at, at this point in the book, um, we were, uh, this chapter is based on a, a piece we had written in the journal Race, Ethnicity, and Education on really um, theorizing the difference between the micro and the macro, that there were folks um, who were, I think, challenging um, racial microaggressions um, because we talk about, in our, in our defining of racial microaggressions, we, we define them as being systemic. And so, um, you know, the, this question around, you know, how are racial microaggressions, which are typical, typically when we experience them, thinking interpersonally people. So this, this visual really um, was, came from kind of, you know, addressing that critique and wanting to show how racial microaggressions 
are a part of broader forms of systemic racism and ideologies of white supremacy. So the visual that you see now, which is the tree, um, had, had, had many variations <laughs> over time. We started with different, different kinds of visuals, different kinds of um, you know, uh, things that could help us understand these connections between everyday racism, institutional racism, and white supremacy. So, so we came to um, develop this kind of metaphor of the tree, right, where we have um, at the bottom of the tree its roots, right? The, the tree exists and can only exist because of its roots. And so that's where we place white supremacy. The, uh, we name um, racial the racial macroaggression, the institutional racism and racial microaggressions. Now, if you follow the roots up, that is the trunk of the tree, right? Um, it, it, it is the institutionalized racism, the forms of the, the policies and the processes um, that, that create um, or, or enable racial microaggressions to happen. Um, and those forms of institutional racism can be found in um, systems like mass media, the criminal justice system. system. Um, and so these are kind of like the branches, right, of white supremacy begin to develop throughout these systems. And those systems maintain ideologies of white supremacy that then um, right, mediate the everyday racism that people of color experience through racial microaggressions. And so here we have you know, the leaves that come from the branches as um, the kind of uh, visual metaphor for a racial microaggression. And really this, th this tree is, is meant to be, um, to be understood holistically, right? That, uh, that racial microaggressions, institutionalized racism and white supremacy are all interconnected. And so to really understand everyday racism, we have to understand uh, how everyday racism is really a consequence of um, racist systems and institutions and of ideologies of, of white supremacy. So chapter four, um, we, we introduce this concept of internalized racism. And we talk about how racism occurs within and between communities of color. Uh, but we're clear that, 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 uh, that the way it, it occurs is through this concept called internalized racism. So we give a couple of examples in this chapter. One is uh, an example of the of Kenneth and Mamie Park's doll experiment uh, that was conducted in the 1950s. That was a study that was used um, to show the impact of racial segregation on the self concept of self identity of black children. Um, and it was one of the few, if only, um, study that was quoted or cited in the Brown v. Board um, uh, case that came down in 1954 that outlawed, um, at least it said it outlawed, uh, uh, legal segregation of black and, and, and white, uh, of black students in, in public schools. Uh, so we, we, we use that, we talk about that with that, that, that concept of internalized racism. The second one is the one we use uh, internalized racist nativism. And we actually use uh, El Teatro Campesinos, a play that they, that they uh, produced in the 1970s called El Corrido. And then we, we take a scene from that play um, and we, 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 we analyze that scene um, about the, the conflict between uh, a Chicano and a Mexicano around this question of uh, racist nativism and internalized racist nativism. And then finally, we talk about intergroup conflict. You know, uh, and that's the, we, we use this, uh, this thing called the Blexit movement or the black exit from the, from the, the Democratic Party movement that surfaced um, in January, I think, of 2018 or 2019, leading up to the 2020 election. And it was led by an African-American um, activist, um, uh, reactionary activist, uh, uh, Candace Owen, uh, to basically uh, um, pull Black people away from the Democratic Party into the Republican Party. But one of the tools she used was, um, was to build the wall. Uh, campaign uh, as, as part of uh, trying to appeal to Blacks uh, to turn against uh, uh, their, uh, uh, their Browns brothers and sisters. And so it, it was that movement. But, but in this particular one, uh, I'm going to share this with, with, now I'm going to turn it back over to, to Lindsay as well. Yeah, so um, I, I mentioned earlier how important um, Chicana Chicano studies and Chicana feminisms in particular have, have been 
in um, our work, particularly in our work more recently. Um, and, and so we open this chapter with this quote from um, Gloria Anzaldúa, which of course, if, if you know Gloria Anzaldúa's work, she is one of the kind of um, foremothers of, of Chicana feminisms. And uh, this is an essay from, um, it, it's, it's called La Prieta. Uh, and here she's describing what internalized racism looks like for her in her own experience. She says, too bad mijita was morena, muy preta, so dark and different from her own fair-skinned children. But she loved me that anyway. She's talking about her grandmother here. What I lacked in whiteness, I had in smartness. But it was too bad it was dark like an Indian. Don't go in the sun, my mother would tell me when I wanted to play outside. If you get any darker, they'll mistake you for an Indian. And don't get dirt on your clothes. You don't want people to say you're a dirty Mexican. And so here, Andalua is really reflecting on the ways that white supremacy has been internalized within the, within the, the Chicano, Chicano community, right? Um, I, I think this chapter was important for us because when we talk about racial microaggressions in our, our classes with our students, because of the ways that communities of color have continued to be historically segregated, the ways that we sometimes experience um, ideologies of white supremacy around, around race is within our own communities and our own families, right? And so we wanted to um, present a, a concept to folks to um, understand that one, people of color um, cannot be racist, right? Um, but we can internalize racism and we can perpetuate um, ideologies of white supremacy within our own communities. And so we, we, um, we attempt to do that through the, the, a model that Danny's gonna be presenting next. And so we, we, we argue that in this frame, that white supremacy is sort of this overarching sort of frame in which uh, I'm gonna share some of what we were thinking about in terms of internalized racism. And it, it, within that frame is this thing we call institutionalized racism as we shared earlier in that tree metaphor. But we, we argue that institutionalized racism along with white supremacy creates these racial hierarchies with whites usually on the top and people of color um, on the on the bottom of these hierarchies and these hierarchies you see these hierarchies um, all the time and I think as Mary mentioned earlier I think an example of that racial hierarchy um, exists every day and it exists uh, today as we look at at the at the murders of um, of the eight um, Asian American and others uh, in, in Atlanta I mean this it, it, part of what's happening is that it, it, these structures of white supremacy and institutionalized racism created these hierarchies, which manifested themselves in in, in one in this case in, in the murder of of, of, of these uh, of these folks in, in in Atlanta. But we argued also that ra this racial hierarchy leads to um, internalized racism, as, as Lindsay mentioned earlier, right? And that internalized re re uh, racism recreates this racial hierarchy within people of color. So you know, uh, people of a lighter complexion will look very look at look differently at people with, with a darker complexion, as was shown by Anzaldúa's quote. And you, many of us have experienced that in our own families. Um, this idea of colorism or, or, or phenotype, uh, and, and and how that manifests itself in, in family and and between communities as well. And so we argue that this internalized uh, racism causes or impacts intra and intergroup racial conflict. So it, 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 and that, that example I gave of, um, of uh, or that we gave of um, the Clark's doll studies, that's intra, that's within. So when a, when a young uh, uh, child, a black child was shown a white doll and a black doll and asked to choose what's the good doll, uh, uh, she or he would always choose, just about always choose the white doll instead of the black doll. And so that's a form of in, intra or internalized racism. Um, the same thing with, with uh, I, I think is the example between um, that we give of inside the, uh, inside the back of the truck in El Corrido between the, the, the Mexican American or Chicano and the Mexican, uh, this conflict between the, the conflict that we share in terms of the dialogue between the two. Um, and we often see that in our own communities as well. I mean, you know, third, second, third generations looking down upon uh, recent immigrants in our community. And so again, this is, this is that intra 
but it also leads to intergroup conflict. And sometimes we see that in the case of um, Candace Owen uh, using the build the wall campaign to sort of split and divide um, the, the Latina and Latino community with the black community around this issue of, of, of uh, immigrants uh, and jobs and that sort of thing. And so we go on to say that this reinforces institutionalized racism. And we also argue that it reinforces white supremacy. And so this is one of the models that we share in that chapter to try to understand um, how internalized racism works within our communities and between our communities around these issues of uh, institutionalized racism and white supremacy. And so uh, we, we want to share something uh, uh, that sort of manifests part of this conversation. Now, this comes later. Um, this comes later than uh, the book, um, but it's also um, important for our conversation here today. Uh, this video, it's, it's a 15 minute video, or I think it's a 15 or 20 minute video by one of my former students, um, Kenjus Watson, Dr. Kenjus Watson. Uh, Kenjus is a postdoctoral fellow up at San Francisco State University, continuing this research right now. Um, but he put together this documentary that I think is just really powerful. And I'm going to recommend that you get this documentary and that you bring Kenjus in to talk to you uh, and his team about this work. Um, but here's, you know, I'm going to share with you uh, this, uh, this, this, this short clip uh, where he talks about some of these issues. And please let me know if you can hear this. And, uh, but before I go on, the collaborators that you're going to be introduced to in this short clip are Philman Halle. He's a baccalaureate uh, recipient from the University of California, Los Angeles in biology. Uh, Ken Justice Watson, who I mentioned, who's a postdoctoral fellow at San Francisco State University. David Stovall, our colleague at University of Illinois, Chicago. And then Imani Robinson, who works in with, with, with Ken just up at, UC, at San Francisco State. She's um, a, a master's uh, of science or master of arts in, in uh, I think, biology or, 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 or the history of science at San Francisco State University. So here we go. Yeah, so I was a biology major, just setting a, a standard for other young people that like, you know, look up to me, right? I think some of some of the hardships I faced were probably uh, some feelings of like isolation. And although that story is unique to me and to my family, it's it's actually a common story amongst us, right, as black folks. And it's an odd bargain to me because schooling in the U.S. has never been intended to generate or create the possibility of black wellness. So now if we think about school as this thing to suffer through, then what does it mean for your physiological and your mental health, right? What does it mean in a place that you are going to where the requirement is for you to sit in your suffering? Say so it's 200 people per class. I don't think I had one friend in any of my classes, right? Most of my friends were in like social studies and things like that. I never really considered them microaggressions until looking back at them, things like um, not, people not wanting to partner with me. So as my mentor, Dr. Daniel Solorsono, often likes to say, for Chester Pierce, the micro and microaggression never was intended to mean small. The micro and microaggression was supposed to indicate the daily, the incessant, the insidious nature of these events, as opposed to something like a macro occurrence. And there's nothing small about daily encounters of harassment with campus police for black students. There's nothing insignificant about daily uh, encounters with professors who don't believe that the work you do is actually your work. So everyone's born with the genetic code that they've inherited from their parents called DNA. This genetic code is incredibly long and it contains pockets of information called genes that are responsible for the characteristics we have. Our genetic code is actually condensed in chromosomes and those chromosomes have little caps on the ends of them called telomeres. These telomeres help us maintain the stability of that code, but again, our research suggests that our stability is in danger based upon our experiences and our environment. 
Adverse childhood experiences or ACEs and other forms of trauma can contribute to premature biological aging. As I researched telomere length and started thinking about applying that focus to a study of black men in white space, I invited some young guys that I had been working with along with other black students at UCLA to participate in this study where we had almost 50 black men. And the findings were unsurprising and yet disappointing. What we found is 30% of them had Tilmer lanes that were similar to a group of women two times their age who had survived breast cancer. If your body is consistently in a stress response, all the functions that normally help us maintain our internal stability begin to dysfunction. The same goes for the maintenance that's around their telomeres. Our telomeres will begin to shorten as a result of this dysfunction. So unsurprising because we know that black people die early, but disappointing because of that story that we're told that success in schooling success in academic achievement could somehow mitigate the harm of racial stress. So to just, so the side story, which I think is really important. You know, Ken just was my doctoral student and we were in a school of education information studies. And we weren't asking these type of questions in a school of education information studies. And so we didn't have the tools to answer some of these questions. So Ken just, I think, um, tried to find out where these questions were being asked and answered. And so he ventured into what we call a UC, that UCLA campus down to the South campus. And he, he ventured into the School of Public Health to help answer these questions. He ventured into the School of Medicine to help answer these questions. So I, I think if you can see, I mean, he was trying to understand the, the physiological impact of everyday racism on young black men. And um, I think, and he, that, 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 that critical question here was that physiological impact, the physical impact, the health impact. And we weren't, at, we weren't as, asking those questions in, in education departments, but they were in the School of Public Health. And that's, he, he ventured down there to help him answer the questions. And this is, I think this study is an amazing study. You'll hear about some of the, the, the after effects of this study in, in a bit, but I just want to, you know, again, showcase Kenjus's work and his thinking um, uh, around these issues. And so the, the next chapter um, gets to, chapter five gets to this question or these, this concept of racial uh, uh, mi microaffirmations. And so here we theorize what, what this means uh, in existing literature or personal stories. And then trying to talk about some empirical evidence that we've been gathering uh, through studies that Lindsay and her students are, are, are engaged in at uh, Cal State University, uh, Long Beach. And so, again, we argue that these microaffirmations, which we'll define in a second, are a response to everyday racism. And so this article that we just published in uh, the Seattle Social Justice Law Journal uh, this last year with uh, Lindsay, myself, and her daughter, uh, Leila Urbethan, um, She's a co-author, co-researcher on this. Find racial microaffirmations. We say that they're often subtle verbal and or nonverbal strategies, or what Henry Lewis Gates called moments of acknowledging for each other's dignity, integrity, and shared humanity, and that makes people feel seen and valued. So that's how we're defining this idea of racial microaffirmations as a response to everyday racism, right? Um, this is, I don't have a clip from this, but I, again, this is one of those sources I would love for you to track down. Uh, you, can, you can Google this. Um, it's Elijah Hassan's uh, 2019 um, documentary called Reviving the Black Nod. It's, it's, I think it's subtitled a, a Love Letter to Black Portlanders, Portland, Oregon. It's an amazing 15-minute video on this, um, this, this, this cultural um, uh, interaction between black people called the black nod and it's it's an amazing story of the of, of how it manifests itself with black people in portland um to, today in this case in 2019 so it's a beautifully done documentary highly recommended um for, for your for, for your classrooms for your research etc and so 
in, in this, I'm going to go back to if these cells can talk. And again, I'm going to bring back Philmon and Ken just to talk to us about um, the, the, the story that comes after the study. Um, and um, an example, what, what Lindsay and I would call, and just in film on what I would call, uh, where racial microaffirmations um, sets in. I graduated a month after that in June of 2018, and immediately I went to Eritrea, which is where my, my parents are from. Um, and I was there for six weeks. I feel like it was the break I needed. I was home, I was reading. I'm with my grandma, right? My cousins and uncles and aunties that I, I haven't seen since I was young. It was cool, it was really a, a centering, like grounding experience, I feel like right after. And then I kind of carried that over, um, going back to San Jose. Every morning, walk to the park and I'd read for an hour and a half. Um, and I felt like this was meditative. Like I never legit meditated, right? Or like the things that, that you think of when you say meditation, but this was my way of like grounding myself. And I felt calm, cool, collected the rest of the day, no matter what I was getting into. It's kind of like a indigenization. So Wayne Swenson and I, a colleague at the Health and Equity Research Lab at SF State, have been able to do a follow-up study uh, that looks again at Philmon's Tilner length. And what those study findings show is that even though it's been about a year and a half to two years, Philmon's so, telomeres, that, which had been I mean, extreme. The story is that, and, and there's even more follow-up to this, um, and again, I'd recommend you bring in Ken just to talk about this. Uh, but th the story is that when Phil went back to Eritrea, to his homeland, went back to his family, um, affirmed by his family, was affirmed by going back to his home country, was affirmed by, in, in all these various ways, uh, it had a physiological impact on him in, in the case of, of, of his telomeres. And so uh, again, we, we're arguing that, that racial microaffirmations um, are, are, are what we're calling, um, they could be, Okay, I'm gonna to have to hit this real quick. Um, they, for some reason, it's not moving forward. Danny, there it is. We're, we're arguing that mi microaffirmations are a protective factor to everyday racism. They, they help protect us uh, from the, the ravages that we experience in the everyday uh, with racism. And so a lot of our research right now, we have a, a publication under review. Uh, we're, we're, we're conducting research that Lindsay will talk about in a second, uh, where we're looking at racial microaffirmations as, as, as protective factors to everyday racism. Um, and so before I do that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Lindsay if you, if you wanna talk about some of that work uh, that we're doing at uh, Long Beach State. Sure, um, we're working with two of my, uh, my grad students at Cal State Long Beach in the SCAE program, uh, Tamara Gonzalez and Gabriela Robles and we are interviewing graduate students of color at the institution to talk to them about what are the ways that they experience racial microaffirmations? What are the ways that they feel affirmed and humanized and, and valued in that space? Um, and, and they're helping us really think in, in some really amazing ways, um, both my students and the participants, right, about what racial microaggressions um, look like. I think one thing that we we're finding um, uh, right now in this piece that we're working on is that microaffirmations can be embodied, right? They they impact your your mind, your body, your spirit. And, and here we're using Chican feminisms, right, to really help us kind of explore racial microaffirmations as an embodiment, right? When you hear music, when you smell, um, you know, a certain food when you see a visual, an art, a piece of art, kind of like the, the mural that's behind Danny in, in his, his background, right? That it, it, it prompts something in you, right? That it, it affirms you that, it, that there's something being recognized, that there's memory and, and embodiment that's really important. And so um, that's, some, that's some work uh, in terms of where our work is going that, um, that we're really excited about moving forward. Thank you. I think we have just a couple more 
play us now. Uh, this is the last chapter, and this is just the future research on racial microaggressions. Um, and for for we give examples of what people who do research, if you're if you're a university researcher trying to find out uh, what more about your campus climate, um, what are some of the, the tools you can use to study racial microaggressions and racial microaffirmations on your, on your college campus. And then in, in the end, we talk about practices. How can we disrupt racial microaggressions? And where is that research headed? Um, and so those are, the, the, those are the ways in which we end, 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 end the work, end, end the book. And so um, we're going to transition here. But, but unless, Lindsay, you have anything else you want to add before we transition to to um, to Louise? No, I, I mean, just just to just to say that I mean that we gave you sort of a, a, a glimpse of the book. I I just wish we were in person. I wish we were able to sort of uh, stop at, at different points along this uh, this this journey and talk to you about what we were thinking, what we were feeling as we're as we're putting this this manuscript together. Because it, it really is, um, it, it, it's a many years in the making, as Lindsay mentioned. I mean, it, it, it goes back to our own experiences as students, just like many of you in, on this call or faculty, just like many of you on this call through as we were uh, putting this manuscript together um, and, and then going in different archives to try to find stories in those archives. And so I just want to, just want to say that I want to thank Lindsay for, you know, um, being on this journey with me. And then, and then Luis, because I think that conversation that Luis, Lindsay, and I had, I think was really important because college press, we chose that press because we wanted to be able to work with Luis to create a cover. And so uh, when they agreed to that, um, um, then, then we agreed to, to, to work with them on, on this book. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Luis. If you don't mind, Luis, I want to uh, give you, um, uh, a, say a few words to introduce oh, uh, Dr. Luis uh, Genaro Garcia. Um, and um, what I'll say about Dr. Luis Genaro Garcia is that he is someone who I met through his awesome partner in grad school and um, we, we got to know each other because of his work um, around the uh, an art project that he writes about and uses in the classroom, which is the Loteria. And it was so um, impressive because it was something that I was also using in my classroom, but it was so awesome to meet someone that had you know um, published and written and really studied it with his students, especially in public high schools. Um, what I'll say about uh, Dr. Um, Luis Genaro Garcia, he's an assistant professor in the Department of Art at California State University, Sacramento. Um, he's inspired by the critical tradition in education, which is known as critical pedagogy. Um, he is an artist, he is a scholar and a former high school art educator. Um, I think what's also important about um, Dr. Garcia is that as an ed educator and artist, he's also influenced by critical pedagogy uh, funds of knowledge um, and also critical race theory and education. He draws an art as a tool to challenge the social and political barriers that exist for communities of color. And he has also collaborated with numerous institutions, schools and art centers, including um, here in East um, Los Angeles, the Self-Help Graphics um, Center, uh, where his art has been featured. And we at Cal Poly Pomona have had the honor of having Dr. Garcia join us in various art workshops with our undergraduate students out of the Cesar Chavez Center for Higher Education and also with the Asian Pacific Islander Student Center. His art is on the cover of books and he has also been, and he's probably not gonna like me saying this because this is Googleable, um, but uh, he has also been featured in the 2019, uh, specifically in the Los Angeles Times uh, because of the various art pieces where he has used um, LA Times archival images to um, overlap in the, and I, I don't know the art language here, but he has done some very incredible work to highlight um, some of the historical moments of resistance. So without further ado, we'll hand this over to uh, Dr. Garcia. Cool. Uh, hi everyone. Well, thank you first and foremost. Um, so I am going to start by sort of giving you an idea of how I sort of organized this part of my presentation. Uh, and I hope it doesn't steer off too much from what, um, uh, you know, was, was assumed 
that was going to go in depth in terms of, of the book design. But I did want to take the time to explain uh, how Danny was, uh, how Dr. Solorzano was previously mentioning that this initially uh, was designed based on all of our experiences. Um, so I wanted to point out also uh, that I will share my experiences as an artist and educator um, that focuses on examples of a practical method of pushing against race and racism through education, uh, but specifically through art education, how I challenge issues of white supremacy uh, at the high school level. So all that eventually becomes part of the design uh, subliminally, uh, but, but to start off again, I wanted to say thank you for having me today and to have the opportunity to once again collaborate with Cal Poly Pomona. Um, and so again, one of the things that I wanted to do as part of this presentation is sort of tell the narrative and the collective of experiences that led to the design of this book and to show the interdisciplinary knowledge uh, that went into this, uh, given that there's a number of future educators present. Um, so to begin, right, this, what the two images you see here is sort of uh, uh, pre, you know, development of what the cover was eventually going to look like. Uh, and, and so as, as uh, Dr. Perez Uber and Dr. Solorzano previously mentioned is, this became sort of a conversation starter, right? Um, they uh, contacted me, they, they said, Luis, we know you're busy, uh, but can you take on another project? Uh, and, and, you know, since 2012, since I started grad school, I wanted to work with Dr. Solorzano, but the opportunity did not present itself. So I went to Claremont Graduate University where Dr. Solorzano is a, an alumni of. Uh, and, and so, you know, our, our, our path didn't necessarily cross until later on, right? So, um, and, you know, the, this conversation so, sort of started as a conversation. And as we're talking, right? Uh, Dr. Perez Uber, Dr. Solorzano were telling me, you know, this is what we were thinking. I went to this exhibit, there were these historical signs. Um, and, you know, this is sort of what I kind of sketched up kind of quickly, but I had multiple images in different papers. Uh, eventually, what I started doing was I started tearing drawings from one paper, overlapping them on another drawing. And so this is sort of what you see on the left image, right? Uh, and so you know, you'll, you'll see, you're seeing the design, the final design of the painting that, that I created of it, of that on the right side. Um, but to kind of move on from that, right, I do want to talk about my upbringing, uh, an art education positionality. Um, I want everyone, especially teachers present, I want you to understand that your experiences are, are what, what's going to inform your educational approach. Um, and, and so I, I like to start by saying that I originally grew up in South Central. Uh, and so this was home on 45th and Avalon. Um, and I start with this because I want to acknowledge, right, what was it that eventually influenced my approach to uh, teaching and teaching art. Um, and, and so this was my graduation ceremony in elementary. Uh, and in the background, what you see is my first official mural, right? It was the first time I acknowledged that someone else acknowledged. And you could say it was a, uh, an affirmation that I was an artist at a very early age. Uh, and so what you see in the background is, is the backdrop that I created for my graduating class. And I stumbled on this picture again later during grad school. Um, and, and I realized right, that I had a conflicting sense of my own identity because I went to school with Black and Latino students, right, but what I painted in this mural was students with light skin and blonde hair. Um, and so it wasn't until I got to high school that I got to experience art classes. Unfortunately, right, as the eldest in a single parent home, I had to drive my siblings to school I have to drive my mom to work. And by the time I got to school, 
my first period art class, there was only 15 minutes left. And that was unfortunate, right? Because at Jefferson High School, a Title I school uh, in South Central Los Angeles, they do not have the types of resources where I could have taken another art class again. It was unfortunate, right, that, and it's still unfortunate that the A through G requirements for high school graduation only uh, require one year of art. And so after that one year of art that I took, I wasn't able to take anything again. Uh, and so it wasn't until I went to the community college, right, that I started learning that I was able to use my experiences for my own art production. Uh, I started drawing on car culture. I started drawing on Dia de los Muertos um, and bringing these, these uh, cultural um, experiences together, right? Eventually, I started doing this work with students. I started bringing things that I felt were relevant for me as a graduate of Jefferson High School and now as an educator of Jefferson High School. And I started finding ways of improving and making work relevant to students. And so here, for example, they created murals at a local elementary because they felt that their community needed more art. Um, and throughout you know, my 15 year experience, I developed this idea, this approach um, for creative resistance. Right. And this is sort of what I started thinking about it. Uh, and so creative resistance are creative forms of expression used by students that challenge systemic oppressive structures, actions or agendas and inequality that diminish the development of communities. Um, and so eventually, right, um, the frameworks that influence over the years, number one, um, the funds of knowledge critical pedagogy and critical race theory. And just to touch up really quick on these, right? The funds of knowledge are the everyday practices and resources that are passed down to students from family households. So whatever knowledge we learn at home, we bring that knowledge to the classroom. Unfortunately, it's never used for knowledge production. Critical pedagogy uses the social political experiences of students, of working class students to develop their social consciousness for social transformation and critical race theory in education acknowledges the oppressive aspects of society and education through race, class, and gender. And one of the ways that I draw on all of these is by developing counter stories to um, the race and racism that exists uh, for students. Part of that is influenced by my own work as an artist, right? And my involvement with my students is initially what influences my work to this day. Um, and so this is just an image of uh, one of the first serographs that I did for self-help graphics in 2012. It was March 26 of 2011, um, when we went out to protest with the marching band, the 5,000 pink slips that were given to educators um, back in 2011. Uh, so just to show how you know, I documented some of those actions of co-working with students, co-teaching uh, and co-learning um, and, and, you know, teaching them about how these uh, uh, pink slips were affecting, would affect them, uh, you know, in the long run academically. Uh, An educational philosophy that I draw on a lot, right, is on one of Freda's quotes. Educators need to know what happens in the world of students. Um, they need to know the universe of their dreams, the language with which they skillfully defend themselves from the aggressive aggressiveness of their world, what they know independently of the school and how they know it. And that's from uh, teachers as cultural workers. Um, but just to kind of point out is that if we want, really want to teach students, we really need to understand what they're experiencing, not only in their communities, in their homes, but even in our own academic settings. Um, I wanted to point out that I eventually ran into the work of Dr. Solorzano and, and Dr. Perez Uber while at grad school and thinking about how to challenge visual uh, forms of racism, right? Um, and, and, and eventually, right, it starts kind of adding 
uh, momentum to how we eventually came to this, right? And one of the things that I uh, actually did with my students is using culturally relevant knowledge to challenge issues of, of race, class, and gender. Uh, and so at one point, uh, I brought in Dr. Um, Ochoa from Cal State LA, uh, professor of art of Latin America, Professor of Latin American History at Cal State LA. Uh, I have a long time relationship with him. And he eventually came in to give students a history of maize from its indigenous origins to the marketing of tortillas um, of being non-GMO, right? Um, so eventually, one of the things that, that I did with students is to challenge these negative representations of South Central in the media. Uh, and so what I sort of wanted to show you was this video clip of how there's this police chase in South Central and there's a shootout at the end. Um, and then, you know, kind of reference to how a student challenged that narrative by drawing something different about South Central and referencing the rockabilly culture that her parents sort of influenced her with. Another example that Dr. Uh, Hernandez mentioned was how I draw on La Loteria to challenge, right, these stereotypical images that, that reference issues of race, class, and gender. Uh, um, and in this uh, example, a student recreates one of the Loteria cards to reflect a positive image of his dad as a homeowner. Um, and then another um, work that influenced my teaching, my scholarship, was when I was asked by Self-Help Graphics to create a, um, the 50th anniversary uh, commemorative print of the high school walkouts, right? And originally, this was one of the images that I stumbled upon uh, when I was doing research on the history of, of the walkouts. Uh, and keep in mind, right, paying attention to the, to the title of this, Student Disorders Erupt at Four High Schools, policeman hurt, right? The focus of this was that the, there was a policeman hurt, right? And one of the things that I did is I started playing with this image in, in terms of how I was going to recreate it. And I eventually changed the headline. I created my own counter narrative, right? Um, and, and you can see that it says student disorders erupt at four high schools. The importance was not the police officers, uh, keeping in mind that it was the police officers that, uh, assaulted many students during the walkouts. Um, so just, just a quick reference, right? And, and so going, going back to, to this image, and this is sort of where I want to talk about how I envisioned um, the cover, right? For, for the book uh, with Dr. Solorzano and, and Dr. Perez Uber, uh, is that I sort of imagined, right? The, the work that I had been doing Right and 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 sort of this philosophy of how I how how I sort of developed an understanding of critical pedagogy through the work of Dr. Solorzano through the work of, of Dr. Perez Uber, and I imagined myself teaching this to students. Right, and so I kind of compare these two images because this is the one on the right on the left is is me explaining the the image I just showed you Cuatlico's legacy for the 1968 walk commemorative um, and, and how I was explaining the historical forms of racism and how that has affected communities of color today. Um, but then, you know, to kind of compare it to the, how I thought about the book, how we thought about the book cover. Uh, and, and it's almost, and it almost mirrors, right? It almost mirrors itself. Um, and so, One of the things I, I wanted to kind of mention to teachers or to educators is that to understand that we're always in the classroom. Uh, it's not just because we're in the classroom means that all the teaching uh, happens there, right? It also happens outside of the classroom. Um, and so with that said, uh, I kind of wanted to come back to this, right? Uh, but to really, um, start talking about the cover, right? Uh, but one of the things that I sort of focus on is Freire's quotes here is that 
It is only when the oppressed find the oppressor out and become involved in the organized struggle for their liberation that they begin to believe in themselves, right? They affirm themselves. This discovery cannot be purely intellectual, but must involve action, nor can it be limited to mere activism, but must include serious reflection. And only then will it be a praxis. So sort of what that, um, uh, Dr. Solorzano mentioned uh, towards the end, right, is how do we continue this work in terms of praxis? Um, and, and so with that said, right, I kind of just wanted to focus on uh, the cover, right? And, and I think this would definitely be a conversation that uh, I'm going to welcome uh, Dr. Perez Uber and Dr. Solorzano to kind of uh, talk about, right? But um, historically speaking, right, uh, some of the images that were discussed in terms of the historical forms of racism that have affected communities of color today, you see in these signs. And even with the current attacks on um, that, that, that we've been hearing about, right? That was something that was perpetuated by the past uh, commander in chief, right? And, and so I think I, I, I want to sort of stop there. Um, to kind of have this be a collective conversation between the authors uh, and myself um, uh, to kind of share with everyone else. Um, so with that said, um, it, just want to end by saying uh, thank you, right? Uh, for considering me for this work, for this important work. Uh, and, and this is just the example of how we need to co-teach one another. And not just because we're educators or professors, but we also, in, in terms of reflection, we need to acknowledge that we have a privilege, right? And, and that that does not mean we cannot learn from our students. Um, but with that said, I wanted to say thank you. Uh, and. Um, uh, Dr. Perez Uber and Dr. Solorzano, did you want to uh, add anything to that? I'll, I'll just thank um, Dr. Garcia for, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I, I'm almost speechless because I, I, I've never, we, we've, we've talked about the book cover before, but never, I've never heard the context of Dr. Garcia, how it connects to kind of, you know, your own experiences growing up and how you, um, developed your your craft and your talent, mm -hmm. um, and 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 tying it to the work that you do with students and the work that you do today. So that was just such an amazing story. Thank you for sharing all of that, and that it was just you know such a a, a great experience for me, who's someone who's not an artist, just to see um, you know you working kind of in real time, we would be on Zoom and you would just kind of sketch things out. And that's how that first sketch that you shared kind of came to be was just uh, us sharing ideas over Zoom and the way that you were able to just so work so quickly um, and, and really kind of just in front of us before our eyes. It was just such a cool experience. It really reminded me of, I mean, in many ways, going back to the connections that you make with Fede, right, is the reflection. It was like this continual kind of reflection that we were making on our ideas in the book, on your visions as an artist and how we might best portray that. Um, it, and it, it was just a really um, powerful experience for me. So thank you. Thank you. You know, I, I mentioned earlier that as a, as a student, I, I, I came in about my junior year to uh, what was called at the time Mexican-American Studies at Loyola University. Um, but it was about 1970 that, that, that I came upon that work, and that work has always been with me. But one of the first places that it came um, was to art was um, was my having taken like some, I think it was a Mexican art class at Loyola. And um, there I was introduced to, you know, Diego Rivera, Jose Clemente Orozco, David Siqueiros, you know, and, and it was their work that really, really had an impact on me as a young, um, you know, Mexican American studies student. Um, so I, that that was really important to be able to see that and then to to be able to go back into my community at the time i lived in lincoln heights um and 
Boyle Heights, that whole area of East Los Angeles, and to see the mural movement begin to sort of emerge in, in our communities. You know, this, uh, this public art, this, this resistant art that was, that, that, uh, was, was, it, was, was popping up in our you know, the, the housing projects, uh, in alleys, uh, on the sides of markets, on the sides of uh, stores. Um, it was just to, to watch it happen. That became, for me, um, my classroom. And so when I first started teaching at, uh, in 1972 at the LA County Juvenile Hall, I used art uh, mm -hmm. to teach. I mean, I used Freire. You know, in, in Freire's work, he talks about generative codes, right? And for me, and, and these are the, the kind of imagery that we use. It could be anything, Freire says. But, but for me, it was the visual image. And, it was, and for me, it was the visual image of this public art that was out in our communities that I would bring back into my, my classroom, project up onto the wall, and have my students engage in a conversation what Freddie would call reading the word and reading the world, right? And so we engage in critical literacy in my classroom with a young, young, I, I, I worked on the boy side, it's called the boy side, young, young, young men who, um, you know, they're, they're, they, they had really difficulty reading. Um, they, you know, they, they, uh, they were uh, survivors of a system uh, that didn't really uh, encourage them uh, build on the strengths they brought into those spaces, whether it was in the juvenile facility or prior to coming to the juvenile facility. But for me, that was really important working with art. And then as a community college professor, uh, my mentor, my, my chair of my department was Roberto Chavez. And Bob basically, again, once again, in, in really pushed me to think about the importance of art in everything that we do. And so, um, you know, for, for, for Lindsay and I, we knew from the very beginning that we needed Luis. We needed him to visualize what we were thinking in the pages of this of, of this manuscript, right? And um, and it was just an amazing experience. And so I almost say that you know anybody who writes a book, you got to have Luis, or or maybe, maybe someone like Luis, but maybe you so much if we could give you too much work, but you need someone like to to visualize what's in the words of your manuscript or whatever that may be. And I think that, um, you know, history has shown me that, that that's really, really important. And um, Luis, again, thank you. I, mean, I keep thanking you over and over again, but the, no this is really important. I mean, um, you, you mentioned that, uh, that uh, we're, we're always in the classroom. I, I, I would also say that we're always in an archive and, and in the archives in our communities, right? Uh, it's in the walls of our communities. It's in it's it's in our it's in our um, it's in our own homes. It's in our the, the imagery in our photo books, our photo albums. It's in the letters, the different sort of correspondence that exists in our own family histories. Uh, that I think uh, uh, it could be part of our research. It has to be part of our research, and certainly part of our art as well. Yeah. No, thank thank you both again for. Um, giving me this opportunity and uh, as you mentioned um, in terms of reaching out to me I mean to me this was a must too just because it overlapped with so many things right it over overlapped with scholarship it overlapped with art it overlapped with activism it, vo it overlapped with education um, and and honestly it, it's it's just that is what's become my my philosophy right so for me uh, and I think we've mentioned this before, was that I saw your vision. I believed in your vision. I, you know, there was a connect to both your visions um, and, and, and your work, right? Um, as I mentioned, I, I use it in my dissertation and, and in my work. Um, so, you know, to me, this was just sort of like a full circle and not being able to, to, to work with you when I wanted to during grad school. It just, it happened, right? Um, and, and so one thing that, that I do want to say is, you know, to everyone is whatever work you're doing, stay focused because the universe is going to align you, align you with the other stars, right? That you need to align with. Um, just an analogy, right? But um, um, so yeah, um, thank you both. I wanted to um, uh, 
just share with you know my students on the call that um, are taking this class that read this this book you know um, as a requirement and and such. Um, uh, Dr. Solorzano and Dr. Perez Uber, when they were talking about their book, they in the videos that they shared um, featuring Dr. Kendris Watson, that's who we met last week in our class, right? And we got to learn from Dr. Watson um, uh, in terms of you know the how anti-blackness um, is the rhetoric and the the if you will the ideology that has shaped schooling that then has impacted other racialized schools. And, and we were really blessed to not only learn about schooling as a dehumanizing project, but also to engage in some of those practices to ground ourselves um, and, and doing this work. Um, and um, you know, to those of you that are you know, guests that are part of this conversation, I, we know why you're here. Um, and, and I just really want to uh, provide the, the first question, if that's okay, for, for someone from my class. Um, my students are all undergraduate students. Uh, majors in either early childhood studies, liberal studies, or ethnic and women's studies. And they're all students that are interested in education as a career, whether it be early childhood, elementary, middle school, high school, community college, or, or higher education. They're, they're undergraduates. Um, and to me, it was really important to bring this work that obviously speaks to all of us. You know, I see several colleagues, uh, faculty, student affairs practitioners on the call, but, but if it's okay, I'd, I'd like to, to, to ask you know, any of my students that are on the call first, if there's any questions or comments you have for um, any of our speakers today. And if I may add, you can do a raise hand emoji if you like, or you know, we can also read um, some of the questions that some folks have posted. Um, I think the first one is by Danielle Hernandez. Daniela, if, um, Danielle, if you want to read or I can read it for you. She asked, um, growing up, did you guys ever think that you would be a part of this important movement in our society today? I know for me, I had never thought I would be in the ethnic studies major, but now that I am, I see what a great community it is and wanting to make a difference. Um, no, <laughs> I think, I think, you know, um, uh, you know, I, I, it, I was just so um, intrigued, Luis, when you shared the picture, uh, your first mural being of, you know, uh, two little white kids, right? And I think, and it triggered when I think about being young, right? And how, um, you know, you you just never had an opportunity. Whiteness was just all around you, right? It it and it still is, and it's still the norm, right? And um, that that was my experience also. Um, you know, I I didn't get to learn about my community, about my history, about you know what it meant to be a person of color until I was in ethnic studies as an undergrad. Um, and so I think that you know. Um, again, it, it's just such an important kind of, you know, consciousness raising experience process that was really critical to the work that I do now. Uh, um, and, and if it wasn't for, for that, I, I, you know, if it wasn't for that experience, I don't, I don't know um, if I'd be doing the work that I, that I do today, at least in the way that I, that I do it, right? You know, in, in, in elementary school and high school, um, I never read uh, a person of color. I don't know if I even remember hearing stories about people of color in elementary school for sure. High school, uh, very little, if any. Uh, for, for me, it begins in the fall of 1968, right? Uh, to, to try to answer your question, uh, in 1968, I was in a world civilizations class at St. Mary's College up in Northern California. And uh, the professor, Jim Collins, he asked us to read, or he was required for us to read uh, the autobiography of Malcolm X. That made all the difference in the world for me. That, that changed me. I mean, it really did change me, that book. Um, I still read that book. I still, um, again, like, like Frederick, uh, like Chet Pierce, like Derek Bell, uh, like Goyan Zaldua, like Patricia Hill Collins, I can go down the list of pe people who I keep, who keep 
schooling me. That was the beginning for me, reading the autobiography of Malcolm X. But more importantly, at that time, as an 18, 19 year old, um, what Jim told us to do, he said, you know what, read it, but you might want to go into Berkeley, go into the record stores and uh, pick up some of his albums, listen to him, listen to how he, he, he articulates these ideas. And so I did that and I went into Berkeley and we bought albums, we bought all of his albums, his spoken word albums. And I still have those albums, I, mean, I now digitize them and I still, I still listen to them because you know, I'm not sure if any of you have heard him talk about um, ideas. Uh, it's just amazing the way he, his use of words and ideas and metaphors and just uh, the way he articulates um, an issue so, um, I, I use parsimony, simple elegance, because that's how I view him in the way he speaks about um, his world. Um, and how he influenced my world and continues to influence my world. So that's when it began for me. It didn't begin in elementary school, middle school, high school. It began, at least that part of it begins with, uh, with reading an autobiography from Malcolm X. Having said that though, you know, I, I mentioned that I grew up in East Los Angeles. Uh, I'm the son of a, of a Mexican baker um, and, a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a grandfather who's a baker, a grandmother who's a baker. I can go on and on. My, I, we come from bakers. And so my father used to deliver bread throughout Los Angeles, uh, Mexican bread, uh, to small mom and pop stores in East Los Angeles, uh, downtown Los Angeles, um, uh, South Central Los Angeles, uh, Korea, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Little Tokyo, Chinatown, all the different mom and pop stores that, that wanted Mexican bread. And my father would deliver to those stores. And my father would teach me stories about our communities as we made our way through these different communities. And my father taught me something that I later become to know as community cultural wealth. My father taught me that every one of these communities had a story. Every one of these communities had, uh, had, had, had sources of wealth uh, that existed within them. And um, that, you know, I, I was an inquisitive young kid. I would always ask him questions and he would answer my questions, but it was always about the positiveness in those communities. Uh, that he taught me. So I guess in those early years, he was training me that our communities were sources of wealth, um, uh, cultural wealth. And I think that becomes foundational to some of the, my later work with, uh, with my colleagues. So we have um, two, two of you that raised your hands, um, Diana and Kevin, and if it's okay, I'll just have each of you ask your question in order. And then that way the, the speakers can respond to both of your questions. So Diana? Yes, hello. Um, so my question is um, for all, all three of you. And I guess I'm, I'm gonna tie it into what, what is happening today in the world. Um, I really liked how your book, you know, validated the racial microaggressions and even just using the tree as a, of a visual, it shows like the importance of it because I feel like um, the media and all of that obviously, um, pay attention to like the, the horrific events of what happens when it's this uh, dangerous. And um, and it's like, well, how is it preventable and all this stuff? And it's like, but look, why don't we also look at like the ones that are happening every day? Those little ones are like easily add up. And I know for me, like being in the classroom, um, how can teachers and professors acknowledge um, these racial microaggressions? Like, how can they create that safe space? Because I know for me, like at a different university, I felt that from my professors. But at the time, I didn't know what it was. I, didn't, I couldn't name it. So thank you for creating this because like, you know, now I can name it and that's just as powerful. Um, so yeah, that, that, that's my question. And then one more, Kevin. Hi. Um, so I I'm, so I love the book. <laughs> Great book. Um, I actually, so around chapter three, um, I, I was actually a little puzzled. Uh, you guys talk about how, um, they, so in the chapter, there's a, there's a picture of a black boy standing next to a tree that has a colored sign. Um, I, I can give you the page, it's page 56 or 57, 56. 
and you talk about how in this specific instance, the racial microaggression is uh, the sign that says colored above the water fountain. And for me, that was like, whoa, like that's the, that's the microaggression back then. Cause as you discussed, you know, in today's world, that's not subtle. That's not microaggression. That's a very big blatant racism. Um, and just to see that that was considered a microaggression back, back then is was really uh, astonishing for me. And I have, uh, I, I guess this would be a difficult question. I have a question regarding, I guess that, is there anything that you can think of today that years, 50, 60 years from now would be considered uh, a, racial, a racial microaggression to us, but is something that's not as subtle in the future? I'll, 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 let, me, let me start with the, the first part of the question. The, the, that picture that I believe takes place in, in 1939, Lindsay, is that the, right, right about then? The, 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 the important thing, Kevin, about that picture is that the reason why we re re refer that as a microaggression, because that was part of everyday life, that that young boy and other young African-American boys and girls and men and women um, experienced Jim Crow. And the sign itself was that institutional racism. There were laws that said that uh, you can put up a sign like that and black people couldn't um, um, uh, or could, couldn't drink at a white fountain, only at a colored fountain, or couldn't go into a restaurant uh, only through a colored door and not a, a white door. So again, these were part of, of, of everyday racism that existed in the 1930s, right? Um, and, and so that's the reason why, and the ideology that, 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 uh, that allowed that to happen was white supremacy, right? Um, and so that's how we frame that picture. And that's how, what, what, how we use the picture the way we did. Um, today, if, you know, 50 years, 60 years, more than that now, maybe a, you know, about 80 years from now, uh, or, or from that picture to today, um, it happens with real estate steering, that certain communities are open to black and brown people, right? Um, you know, re real estate agents will not take you to certain houses certain neighborhoods, certain spaces, right? They'll, they'll steer you towards um, uh, places that, uh, where there are other folks of color. And there's a history behind that as well. Uh, we don't talk about it in the book, uh, but, but you know, the, the history around um, uh, redlining, that sort of thing. So uh, again, from that picture to today, I think it still exists in our classrooms. I mean, LA has some of the most segregated classrooms, schools in the country. Right, uh, Latinos are one of the most segregated uh, student populations in the country, right? And so there's not a law that says that 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 Mexicans have to go to a certain school, but the schools are segregated, right? Um, there are certain schools that are 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 open to certain folks of color. I mean, some of these charter schools uh, where you have to have a uh, you got to take a test to get in. That's that's a that's a form of 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 uh, of, of uh, keeping people out that's a tool that keeps people out you know testing uh, for some of these, uh, these 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 programs in schools i mean we studied things like um in high schools a couple of years ago we studied access to advanced placement courses in high school in our early work we found that um certain schools that serve mostly black and brown and poor kids had zero ap course offerings advanced placement course offerings and certain schools that service more affluent, mostly white students, had 10, 15, 20 AP offerings. So it, you know, it doesn't look the same as it did in 1939 with that photo. It looks different now, but it still exists, right? And it has these different forms that it takes. And we can talk about those diff different forms in different contexts. I just use housing education as two. Lindsay or, or Luis, might you be willing to share um, some thoughts around what educators and professors can do um, around this conversation of racial microaggressions within classrooms since it's something that impacts students on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, I think one thing that I always do in my classes is I make sure that I'm including 
folks of color in the readings, right? I think just something as simple as making sure that you are including the voices of people of color, that there are people of color that are looked at as the experts in your, whatever your content area is that you're, you're reading. And I, and I tell my students at the first day of class that I do that and why I do that. I think, you know, to get them to think about um, just the fact, uh, Danny and Luis were talking earlier, you know, when, when you think about when is the first time that you read a person of color in school or in college, right, or, or was it until college that that happened, um, that 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 is really powerful, right, that, that representation matters. Um, I think there's other things that we can do. There's you know, um, in terms of recognizing racial microaggressions is that students have to know that you're open to having that discussion. So that means rather than putting the burden on the student to begin the discussion or the dialogue about race or racism, that I'm doing it as a professor, right? That I'm in front of the classroom, I'm bringing in news about the anti-Asian racism that we're seeing and what happened in Atlanta to open up my, my class on Monday, right? So that my students aren't the ones that have to do that and feel like, is it okay or is it not? Does she wanna talk about this? Does she not? and that that provides kind of this it, it opens the door right to let students know that these are discussions that we want to be having these are discussions that we need to be having in our classrooms uh, I did want to add to that uh, thank you for that Lindsay uh, and then this is termed in, uh, in terms of Diana's question that she asked earlier um, how can educators, professor, professors acknowledge ra racial microaggressions and how can they create a safe space environment? Um, at, at least through my experience as a high school educator, right? This is a hard topic to kind of talk about uh, sometimes because um, it, it, it's heavy, number one. Uh, some students do acknowledge, uh, you know, the, the, not only the stereotypes, but the profiling that happens based on the way they look. Um, and so one of the ways that I've done that is by constantly drawing on history. So whatever subject you're, you're going to end up teaching, if you want to teach this, you need to reference the historical examples of racism, like the Zoot Zoot riots, like the 1968 student walkouts, uh, like Operation Wetback, um, you know, you're going to have to research, you know, and, and California has its, you know, uh, in-depth uh, history of some of these examples, right? Historical examples of racism. Why is South Central or why was South Central predominantly black? Because in 1938, um, uh, there were racial restrictions on where they could live up until 1938. Um, and so that's why South Central is a historically black neighborhood. But again, resources were not being uh, uh, provided to that particular area. Uh, so why is there higher poverty rates there? We, we need to understand and students need to understand that this has been a historical uh, happening that has affected them today uh, in their communities and, and, you know, in their own ethnic groups. Um, so I think you know, whatever subject you teach, you're going to have to get creative in that way. And, and this is the importance of interdisciplinary perspectives and the importance in uh, having students understand that this is a shared uh, experience among communities of color. We are out of time. And in many ways, uh, conversations like the one today um, um, end in this way. We often, I think as critical educators, um, when we have discussions like this, they're, they're too few in some cases, right? Because we're so busy with so much going on. Um, but we also leave with a lot more questions. And I think about what responsibility that places on us as um, students, educators, administrators, I see so many, so many folks on this call that I, that I deeply admire and respect. Um, like what, what, what do we do with the questions that we have that we're left with? And it's not just because we're out of time and the speakers can't speak, but what, what can we commit, right? To ensure that we look for those answers, right? And one of the ways, you know, to do that is to, to access the, the materials, to access the articles, to access the texts, 
so that we can um, learn and incorporate into our teaching, but also to make sense. And um, I forget who said it earlier, but this is why I think working with um, Danny in graduate school was so important for so many of us. Um, the research that he did along with so many people before him and after him, what, what a lot of the research that they did was doing for us is that it was giving us language for our day-to-day -day experiences within the institutions and outside of the institutions, making sense of how racism was manifesting in our homes, in the streets of our communities, in the classrooms, et cetera, and having the language, and that's why critical race theory and education is the framework that I use for this course for my undergraduate students. Having the language is a key way to acknowledge and to remedy the problems that race and racism bring to our communities. Um, with that said, I wanna thank everyone for coming and definitely hand this back over to Dr. Mary um, Danico, who is um, a great colleague of mine. I'm really, really happy to be, to have landed on a campus where Dr. Danico is at um, to, to provide some closing remarks on behalf of the Wegley. First and foremost, thank you. Thank you, thank you for this incredible session where I, I know that you didn't have a chance to read through all the chats, but I think it's very reaffirming, the micro affirmation. Um, I think it gives us a sense of solidarity and purpose uh, and uh, some of uh, a roadmap of sorts, right? In terms of how we can build a community together and to respond to the heinous actions that so many of us face on the daily. And as uh, Danny, as a fellow sociologist, I really appreciate you, you know, mentioning the daily, um, the notion of microaggression as a daily event and a daily circumstance and in light of what's happening. I, I wanna give a special thanks to Dr. Jose Aguilar Hernandez, who is equally, the love fest is here, definitely, but um, always mindful of what is needed, um, but never, but so very humble in being gracious with his time and his energy in bringing other folks to the table. I also want to recognize my two awesome Wegland interns, Kelly Wen and Daniela Castillo. Um, they are behind the scenes doing some incredible work. But most of all, I thank all of you who came and showed up and was present and engaged today. So important. In the future, I do want all of you back on campus when we can have you and host you properly, break bread together and you know, really unpack this knowledge, but also think about what are the next steps as Dr. Aguilar Hernandez talked about. So thank you all for joining us today. It was a wonderful and inspiring session and we're ready to fight. So let's get at it. Thank you. Please thank don't so forget. Much. Oh, I'm sorry, I haven't said, don't forget to fill out the surveys. <laughs> Lindsay, thank sorry, you, I didn't mean to cut you off. Thank you everyone for having us. Um, I always love collaborating with CPP. Can the link be sent again? Sorry, I, or do I have to scroll back to the top for the link? Oh, for the, um, Daniela, if you don't mind, could you uh, post it for uh, Professor Colazzo? All right, thank, thank you. you. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Jose, for coming too. And, um, Danny, Lindsay, and Louise, if it's okay for folks to contact you later on, would you mind if they emailed you if folks had questions or just wanted to? I know we had several questions in the chat box that we didn't get a chance to answer. Um, perhaps uh, the Wegler interns could kind of copy and paste those and send them to you and we can share them, your responses to our students and our participants. That would be great. And- yes, um, I'd like that. Wonderful. Yeah. And I would no, love I to stay in touch with all of you. Very inspiring work. You know, I wasn't able to save the chat. Um, was Daniela able to save the chat? Well, we see the chat right now, and it doesn't go away until I end the session. So but there's usually a place where I can save it, but there's nothing there where I can save it. Uh, I, I think wondering. the I think the host might be able to send you uh, okay. a transcript of the chat. Yeah. Yeah. Let me see if I'm. Not, I think I'm not sure. <laughs> If not, I also took screenshots of the questions um, okay. if there was a time that I could say it. So I have, I do have pictures of some of the chats. Okay. Great. Daniela, if you get a chance to save it though and send it to me as a PDF file, I'd really appreciate that. Okay, definitely. Thank you.
Yeah, let me see if I can go ahead and share that on the share drive. But yeah, thank you so much. I mean, it was it was wonderful. I think it really gave folks tangible um, action items and, and the way to uh, translate and interpret microaggression. I think folks can feel it and intuitively get a sense of what that all means. But I think being able to uh, use the words and images, I think the the art activism is also so incredibly powerful. And so thank you so much. The collaborative spirit between all three of you. And really, Danny, your mentorship is uh, it's, it's awesome. You know, love meeting faculty members who have that intergenerational impact on our scholars and future scholars. So thank you so much. Thank you. I've been blessed. I've been blessed. I, I continue to be blessed. What am I saying? I have really, really good students right now too, but thank you. Well, speaking of, I'm going to actually stop.